myself rather silenced and um, obviously saddened by the thought of her absence. Um, I can, as, as much as I try to remember all of the, the past experiences and things and just picturing her sitting right there mm -hmm. for so many years, um, I think that numbness sometimes makes it hard to even recall. You know, just, I keep reaching for things and they don't come. Not that they're not there, but I think there's more emotion there. And um, it helps, obviously, to dwell on the promise of heaven. But at the same time, it, it helps as well to lean into a moment like this together and feel it, no matter how intense it gets, uh, simply because God gave you feeling. He gave you the opportunity to grieve, and he gave us all the opportunity to let that shape us. Um, it just helps me to know that the presence of the Lord and the sustaining presence that he brings comes mainly through just trusting him in moments where you could just enter into them fully. Uh, not try to explain it away or try to uh, think of something else. You know, this is, this is a, a reality that we have, right? Um, Jesus said at one point, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Um, Kathy didn't get to stand on this earth and see that happen. Um, and all of us will continue to die to see that happen, right? But um, I guess I've always been one of those people who believes, always used to believe anyway, that if God really wanted everybody to believe, he could just open up the sky, walk in, and everybody would go, he is God, I believe. And I'm smart enough to know that's not the truth, because people who walked with Jesus and saw him do what he did still didn't believe. So something even spectacular like that, um, as much as I would think and, and pro probably even hope. But what I do know is that um, Kathy didn't have to wait here to see it. She is down there to mm -hmm. see it. And that is a, that's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing because Jesus didn't choose to show people his glory in the divine part of his glory. But when he said that verse um, with regard to the fact that he was, uh, that one day people would see the, him coming in glory, he was speaking of that moment of transfiguration that he took Peter and James and John up on that hill, right? You remember that story? Mm -hmm. And at that moment, they were able to see that something other than the, the human Messiah in Jesus. Um, and Jesus did it quite spectacularly, if you remember that story. You remember kind of how he did it. They went up on this hill, and, and Luke's account of the transfiguration says that the three disciples who were with him were very heavy with sleep. In other words, they were tired. It was much like the scene in the Garden of Gethsemane, where they all went and they were all sleepy. But unlike the Garden, where all they saw was the human side of Jesus, here their eyes were opened to the divine side of Jesus. And um, he shows them that. He shows them that as his face begins to shine like the sun. That's, that's an amazing thing when you think about his clothes just glowed white. And not only that, but he was standing with Moses and Elijah. Now, I don't know if the, if the guys have never seen it. They're, they're not on a postcard somewhere, so I'm not so sure how, they, other than, you know, Jesus said, this is Moses, this is Elijah, I don't know. I don't know how it they knew it was them. When you think about it, here's Moses, the one who represents the law, and here's Elijah, the one who represents the prophets. And what the law and the prophets had always proclaimed was the Son, right? But he was to be the Son of God. There's no, there's no interaction between them, between the three disciples and the three Jesus and, the, and Moses and Elijah, but when Luke says they turn to leave, it's Peter, of course, who stands up and says, hey, wait, maybe let me, let me, uh, 
Let me build three tabernacles for you. Let me, let, you know, one for you, and one for you, and one for you. And the interesting thing was is that uh, Luke says the, <laughs> that, they, that Elijah and Moses were talking to Jesus about his departure that was to happen in Jerusalem, basically his death. But the word departure is, is the, in the Jewish, the, the Hebrew word exodus, all right? So Peter heard that and then starts thinking about building Tabernacles, which is very much like the Feast of Booths, right? Where it recalled the idea of Israel in the wilderness, living, you know, out in the wilderness like that. It was easy for him to start saying, oh, well, let's, let's do this because it's so appropriate in, in the moment. Well, if you remember, the father very tactfully ignores Peter, even while he's talking, and then breaks in, <laughs> sends this cloud down upon them. And he says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And then he says, listen to him. Not to you, Peter. <laughs> listen to him. Right? The clouds disappear. And when they heard that voice, Luke says, the three of them just fell on their faces in fear. Just totally gripped. But then those three disciples experienced something very unexpected. Somebody came up behind them and touched them. They had just seen the glory of God, and yet somebody came up and touched them. And when they opened their eyes, you know who it was. It was Jesus, right? And I guess I'm telling you all of this and why it came to my mind. The scripture says they only saw Jesus, right? It was perfection touching imperfection. It was God coming to man. And in that moment, I guess telling you this, um, knowing that for Kathy, the veil has been lifted from her. And like those three, disciples not only saw Moses and Elijah, I mean, that's who she sees now. I mean, think of it. She sees Adam and Eve, right? She sees Abraham. She sees David. You name it. She sees it. They're all there. But most importantly, what she feels is the touch of God. Because the word reminds us every time we open it in Revelation, that it is he who will touch. It is he who will wipe away every tear from your eyes. Imagine that. And I think Jesus gave us a great example when he simply, after letting them know the Son of God is in your midst, still the Son of God wants to touch you and he wants to touch them. So where does that leave us? Well, I guess it's basically in my mind, let's not be so asleep to his presence, as invisible as the presence of God is in our life for the most part, that we forget that the glory that emanates from him and the voice of the Father that says, listen to him, continues to speak to us, right? We need to continue to see him in glory just as we know that Kathy sees him in glory today. We just want that fullness that she sees. His word compels us to listen to him and to live in the light of his presence, even when it's hard, even when it's sad, and still try to strive to walk worthy with him and for him, no matter what, no matter what the, the trial is ahead. Jesus said that in the world, you will have tribulation. And anybody who has to fight ALS knows what tribulation is. But take heart, Jesus said, I have overcome the world. So now the touch of the Savior will always be there. He began that work in all of us. He will complete that work in all of us. It's his hands that are shaping you and me. And when we keep looking above where Jesus is and fix our eyes on the, the author, the perfecter of our faith, we, like the disciples, lifting up our eyes, even in the most terrifying of circumstances, will see only Jesus. Mm -hmm. 
Romans 12, Paul writes, Love one another with brotherly affection. <coughs> Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. And the Son of God said, In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. And that's what he has done for Kathy, and that's what he's going to do for you and me. So, again, if you would reach for the anthem, only Jesus. Thank you.